Welcome to the final video in our three-part lens class. This time, we'll wrap up with some specialty lenses, lens care and maintenance, and some more terminology. This time, let's start by discussing a class of lenses that do their job a little differently than the other lenses we've discussed. Specifically, I'm talking about wide-angle and fisheye lenses. These are lenses that bend the rules of perspective, literally. Normal human vision sees long, straight, parallel lines appearing to converge in the distance, so straight railroad tracks will appear to connect. From street level, tall buildings might look like a pyramid wide at the bottom and almost coming to a point at the top. When all the lines of perspective in an image are straight, it's called rectilinear. Lots of lenses can deliver this kind of image, but when a lens is specifically designed to gather a wider than normal field of view, there's a point at which optical correction of curved lines is just too much to ask, and the lens needs to deliver curved lines of perspective in order to gather that additional wider information. The result is a bloated image, and you'll remember from our second video that bloating is called barrel distortion. Some minor barrel distortion can be seen on the wide end of many zoom lenses, but lenses that are specifically designed to only gather wider fields of view are, of course, called wide-angle lenses. The most extreme of these is a class of lenses called fish-eye lenses, where the distortion is deliberately allowed to remain as an effect. As with minor barrel distortion, even the dramatic fisheye barrel distortion can be corrected during post-processing, but the bent lines may not go away entirely. Another kind of specialty lens is a macro lens, and it's intended to allow focusing at very short distances, in many cases magnifying the subject even beyond human vision. Nikon macro lenses are called micro, while everybody else calls theirs macro, but it all means the same thing. Now, there are complete classes on macro lenses and macro photography, but since this is just an overview, let me mention a few more things and suggest that you contact one of the pros at B&H for specific pre-purchase questions that you might have. First, you should know that there are different focal lengths of macro lenses, and the one which you choose will determine how far away you can be and still capture a good magnified image of your subject. For instance, sometimes in a controlled environment like a studio, you can be very close to your subject, while in nature you can't always be that close, so a longer focal length will bring you closer. Second, you almost always want to use a tripod so you can get tack sharp images of those tiny subjects. Even slight movements mean blurry images. Third, when you focus on very close tiny objects, even with a normal aperture setting, you get a very shallow depth of field. This creates a new challenge, and there are several things that you can do in order to increase the depth of field. Stop down the lens as much as possible. Remember, stopping down means making the aperture smaller. And also remember, a smaller aperture is a bigger number. But when you do stop down, you either need to add lots of light to your subject, or you need a long shutter speed to let in more light over time. Also, keep in mind, stopping down to the extreme end of some lenses can start to affect your sharpness negatively because of diffraction. This will be a bit of a balancing act in the end. Another thing that you can do is raise the ISO to increase the camera's sensitivity to light, but be careful here. Raising it too much can add noise, and macro photography is all about fine details with as little noise as possible. It sounds really challenging, doesn't it? Well, there's a piece of specialty equipment that you can use to manage that super shallow depth of field, and it's called a macro rail. And you mount your camera on it, then set your lens to manual focus, and use the control dials on the macro rail to make microscopic adjustments to the position of your camera. That way, your super shallow depth of field lands exactly where you want it on your subject, and you can move it slightly with the macro rail itself. Then. If you use Photoshop, there's a process for combining several images into one called image stacking. 
You would shoot a collection of macro images, one after the other, while slightly moving the macro rail and shifting your depth of field slightly until you photographed each part of your subject in focus in one of those images. Then combine all the focused parts into a single image. All that just starts to tell you the story of macro photography. There are extension tubes you can use to convert a non-macro lens into a macro lens. There are magnifying filters that you can add to the front of lenses. But with each of these approaches, there are trade-offs. When it comes to telephoto lenses, there's the true definition and the accepted term. Technically, a telephoto lens is one with a long focal length, but one which has special lens elements which allow the physical length of the lens to be shorter than the actual focal length. Now, at this point, a few tech nerds like me are thinking, yeah, and? While most non-tech people are thinking about fast-forwarding through this part of the video. Fortunately, though, most people using the term telephoto are just referring to a lens that has an especially long zoom range, and we'll leave it at that. Just a little advice here. If you're considering getting a telephoto lens to shoot distant subjects, you should get used to the fact that you'll get the best results when you use a tripod. And if you're really going for tack sharp images, you need to minimize shake even more. So a remote cable release is a really good idea as well. Taking long distance photography in a slightly different direction, there's a whole category of photography based on adapting long range spotting scopes to cameras. It's called digiscoping. And if that sounds like something that you'd like to know more about, you'll be glad to know that I've put together a lot of information about it for you. And it's not just in this video. I did a two-part video series all about digiscoping with Swarovski brand scopes and adapters, and it's also here on the B&H video channel. Another kind of lens with a very specific purpose is something called a tilt-shift lens. With all the components sealed up inside lens tubes, it's easy to miss the incredible engineering that goes into creating DSLR lenses. But tilt-shift lenses have some setting dials on them and some light bending characteristics that just make me say wow whenever I use them. That's because they bend light in ways that we're just not used to. For example, with most lenses, photographing architecture means vertical lines will tend to converge in the distance. We talked about this earlier when we were covering perspective, but a tilt shift lens can be shifted so that the light reaching the sensor eliminates those converging lines. Vertical lines are kept straight in camera without the help of software or post-processing. Architectural photographers love this kind of lens because it captures the best possible representation of straight architectural lines. Another fun characteristic of this family of lenses is the tilt feature. By tilting various lens elements, you can adjust the plane of your depth of field to be different than the image sensor plane of the camera. If you can do that, you can create special effects like turning a real-life image into something that looks like a miniature. When it comes to lens adapters, there are several major types, each with a specific purpose. There are teleadapters, sometimes called teleconverters, that change the focal length of lenses to make them longer range lenses for more powerful zoom. For example, adding this 2x teleadapter to this full-frame Nikon converts the focal length of this lens from its native 70 to 200 millimeter range to an expanded range of 140 to 400 millimeters. The catch is that teleconverters usually cut the maximum aperture, and this one cuts two full stops of light. So this f2.8 70 to 200 with a 2x teleconverter is now an f5.6 140 to 400 millimeter lens. Also, some degradation of image quality might happen with peripheral areas and autofocus may or may not work depending on the specific camera. Keep in mind that's just one example and there are other converter lengths and different brand converters available as well. Another kind of lens adapter is one that changes lens mounts from one system to another. So for example, you could use a Nikon lens on a Canon camera. As you probably guessed though, there are a number of trade-offs here as well. First, you almost always lose autofocus capability and you always lose camera-based aperture control. With this in mind, you can buy a dumb mount converter if your lens has an aperture ring. But if you want, you can buy an adapter with a built-in aperture ring so that your lens doesn't have to have one. Let's wrap up this series with some tips and a few more lens vocabulary terms. 
With vibration reduction or image stabilization technologies, whether in camera like a Sony or lens based like Nikon and Canon, you should turn it off whenever you're using a tripod because it can actually introduce shake or blur in some circumstances. Your camera may be a little or very weather sealed and the same holds true for your lens. While it's a good habit to try and always keep your lens away from dust and rain, if you know that there's some place like that that you'll be shooting, it only makes sense to use gear that's outfitted for the environments where you'll be using it. When you're changing lenses, it's a good idea to be indoors in an environment with as little dust as possible. Then, get everything ready for a quick lens change and point your camera toward the floor. Unseat the current lens and screw on the new one and put the lens tail caps in place as quickly as possible. Here's a cool little home repair for a common lens problem that I invented. I say that because when I came up with this idea and I showed it on a photography show, nobody else anywhere was doing this. Since then though, there are companies selling a product for this specific repair. One of the lenses that I own is the Nikon 18-200, but this specific situation happens with lots of lenses. It's called lens creep, and if you have your lens extended part way and then pointed down, gravity can pull the lens and extend it further than you may want. Most lenses with lens creep are perfectly fine otherwise and considered to be in spec, so that you can't send them in for repair to get it fixed. What you can do is wrap a band, like one of those rubber wristbands, around the lens where the zoom ring meets the stable part of your lens. It adds just enough resistance to stop that lens creep. One last quick tip is that used lenses, especially from a reputable dealer like the B&H used gear department, are a great way to get your hands on good glass at a nice savings. Just be sure to investigate that the particular model of lens is truly compatible with your camera. Besides issues like cropped frame lenses on full frame cameras, there could be other issues with some older lenses not having the proper computer chips on board to communicate with the camera that you're using. It's a somewhat rare problem, but it does happen from time to time. So, as you can see, there's a lot more to lenses than just focal length and aperture. And depending on your needs, it's often worth investing in several lenses for your various needs. Consider things like the quality of the lens elements, lens coatings, aperture, focal length, zoom range, and even the materials the lens barrel is made of. Before you buy a lens, make a little checklist of the things that you need the lens to do. Then read the reviews and talk with the pros. User reviews are on the B&H website right there with each product description. And of course, experts are available at the B&H Superstore and you can talk to them in person or over the phone. We know that there's a lot more to lenses than we've covered in these three short classes, but we hope you've gotten something out of them, and we hope you're a more educated consumer and a happier photographer. For Kelby Training and b and I'm Larry Becker. Thanks for watching. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b and has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help. Scott Kelby here and welcome to this quick tour of our online training. We have hundreds of online classes for you covering everything from lighting to landscape photography. From portrait photography to sports, we have classes on wedding, automotive photography, shooting, food, fashion, travel, you name it. The most incredible part of this is the price. You get all of this for just $199 a year or you can pay monthly for just $24.95. 24 hour a day, 7 day a week access from anywhere in the world. I invite you to join with us today and start learning right now.